Welcome to the Details of Life. I'm your host, Marcus Wilson, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming back and tuning in and giving me your time. I promise I will not disappoint. Today, we have head coach of Purdue University, Matt Painter. You know, I got to know Matt back in the late 90s when I was working the basketball camp at Eastern Illinois when he was assistant coach there. And, you know, he was a cool guy. We hung out, you know, after camp and everything. And the thing about him is he's still a cool guy. You'll see in the interview, he's very engaging. But at the same time, I was really, really impressed at his basketball knowledge. Like, I, I was impressed. Like, I actually wrote down some notes after we got done talking. How he builds a team, how he builds a culture, you know, because most of us will not have five-star players every year. You know, Duke, Kentucky, for high school level, prolific prep, Mount Verde, they get five-star guys every year. For the majority of us, we have to build up a team. We have to build up a culture. We have to build players up. And obviously, Coach Painter's done it the right way because Purdue is always at the top of the Big Ten. I'm not going to talk about too much right now before we get in with coach painter because we we talk about so much and i don't want to give any spoilers but i will say i mean his record speaks for itself where they finish in the big 10 you know i believe he's 15 and 12 in the ncaa tournament so when you have more wins than losses in the ncaa tournament and that many appearances it lets you know you're doing something right you got a lot to learn from this episode so without further ado enough of me talking let's go ahead and chime in with purdue head coach matt painter Like I just prefaced, ladies and gentlemen, today we have Purdue head coach, Matt Painter. How are you doing today, coach? Doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you so much for making the time. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started and go right in and go throughout your career. But I want to go back to you as a player. And you played with some Purdue greats, Jimmy, Oliver, Big Dog. And you played against some really good guys. That was a very, very strong era. Sean Respert, Calvert Chaney. What were some yeah. of your best memories as a player at Purdue? Well, I grew up um, in Indiana and like, you know, before ESPN hit and cable, you know, that's what you watch. You'd have, you know, your regular three channels and you'd have channel four and you watched the Indiana Purdue game. So you were really locked into the Big Ten. So when I was started to get recruited and it wasn't one of those things where I had big name schools on me um, until the end. I signed in the spring of my senior year, but, you know, I wanted to play in the Big Ten and it came down between Minnesota, Michigan State and Purdue. I had visited Evansville um, early and really liked Coach Cruz and their program. Um, I lived on Ball State's campus. I was always over there. I loved Coach Majerus. But I was, you know, I was infatuated with the Big Ten. That's what I grew up around. And uh, I was very fortunate. They had 15 scholarships back then. And uh, uh, be able to get a scholarship to Purdue it was a dream come true. And so you get recruited by a lot of people. And it makes you feel like, hey, man, I'm pretty good. But, like, I always played pickup at Ball State. And so I'd realize that, like, all these schools would recruit me. I'd be like, hey, man, like, I'm not better than these guys at Ball State. So, you know, how is, like, Purdue and Michigan State, you know, offering me a scholarship when I can't even, you know, I don't know if I'd play if I if I signed to play at Ball State. I don't know if I could even get in. They were 30-3 and three in my senior year. Um, they were great. That year, Evansville, um, you know, it was fantastic. Um, and, and so they, I think they won close to 30 games also and uh, had a really, really good team. And, and so, like, to me, I had a pulse on that. But then again, that was always my dream. And then when I got to Purdue, it was like, Shh, I don't know if I'll ever play here. And so physically I was just so weak and had to work towards things. But, you know, being able to, to, to play there and to be able to grow there and end up, um, you know, playing, I ended up starting 50 games in my career. And uh, just being a part of, you know, Coach Katie was great. He was a good man. He was always honest with me. Um, I didn't always like what he said, but he, he was always honest and direct. And that really helped me um, in recruiting and it really helped me um, to be a coach is just always be fair with guys, always be honest with guys and be direct with them. Don't, don't tell them things um, just to make them feel good. That's not true. You know, make sure you, you're diplomatic about things and professional, but, but make sure you tell them the truth and, uh, but I just had a great experience there. Then I ended up obviously going into coaching. But um, the play at that level was amazing. Uh, um, you know, the Fab Five was two years um, younger than me. I was in the same grade with Jim Jackson at Ohio State, Calvert Chaney and Greg Graham and Pat Graham, um, you know, in Indiana. 
Illinois had some really good teams. Deion Thomas ended up being the all-time leading scorer at Illinois. Um, he was there. But when I got it, my freshman year, and I, I didn't play very much, but like Ramil Robinson, Terry Mills, Louis Fought, Sean Higgins were at Michigan, uh, Steve Bardo, Kendall Gill, um, you know, was at Illinois. Uh, the, bad, the bad teams in our league had pros is the best way I can put it. You know, Rex Walters was at uh, Northwestern um, at, at that time. And so, I, you know, I could go on and on, but it, it was just – it was great coaches. It was legendary coaches. Tom Davis, Lou Henson, uh, Judd Heathcote, Bob Knight, Gene Cady, you know, across the board. Gary Williams was just leaving um, to go to Maryland um, when I came into the league. And Randy Ayers took over and had a really good run there at Ohio State with that crew. So, um, it, was, it was big time. You know, the TV, we had Big Monday on ESPN. Um, and uh, to get into those slots and on ESPN, that's what everybody watched. You know, you didn't have a Big Ten network or, you know, have, you know, it was past Raycom and Channel 4 at that time. So, you know, the cable would really hit. So, um, and the fans at Mackey Arena, you know, I just thought that's the way it was. You know, all of our games were sold out. Uh, my first year in Coach 3, I wanted to know where all the fans were. You know, but that's just not the way it was. You know, it's just – so you get spoiled the way they treat you, the way you travel, the fans, the loyalty. Um, it was pretty cool. I, I'm, I'm very grateful um, for that experience, and it really helped shape uh, myself going into the coaching business. Yeah, man, you you named some dynamite names during that time. I named a couple, but you're right. It was just, it was just a high level of play. I did go out and do some research. I always do my research, Coach. So I, I talked to a couple of people about you as a player – and then, you know, kind of going into being a coach, and I, I talked to Calvert Chaney about you, and, and this is what he said. He said, uh, Matt was a, a great player. He was smart, tough, had a great work ethic, and gave it everything he had for every second he was on the floor. It's not surprising why he's had such great success at Purdue as their head coach. And then I also talked to Brandon Brantley. See, we keep good secrets from you, coach. I talked to Brandon on your staff, and he says – uh. We kind of always knew he was going to be a coach. He was always an organizer. He was that player that would go into the coach's huddle with suggestions and questions. So you say you didn't play very much, but you did progress, and you were a big part yeah. of that senior team. I mean, your senior year when you guys had Big Dog and Zoe and yourself, you guys were really, really yeah. good. But uh, did and you always know you wanted to coach? Yeah, I always wanted to coach. And so my dad coached me when from kindergarten to about fifth grade. Um, my dad always would take me around. He was, a, he was an IU grad. He would take me around and see all the guys that had committed um, to Indiana. He was from Fort Wayne, so we'd always go to Fort Wayne and see, you know, the really good players or the, the players in Marion or Muncie or Anderson. We just lived in such a good um, area of basketball at that time. But it was interesting. Calvert said some things, and most of what Calvert said was accurate. You know, I talk to guys about it all the time. Like, if you're great, people will talk for you. And Calvert was one of those guys that was great as a player, but he was so humble as a person. And it was pretty cool for me because I went to the College Basketball Hall of Fame this year to see the induction because we had a, one of our former players, Terry Dishinger, who was a starter on the 1960 Olympics team, three-time NBA All-Star, um, just a class man and a, a gracious person, but just a great basketball player at Purdue and in, in, in the NBA and was starting on the Olympic team in 60 with Oscar Robertson and Jerry West. But it just all the, all the values that I felt Terry had as a person here was Calvert Chaney going in, you know, who's my age at the same time. And he had those same values as a person. And then and that's a lot for young people to understand. Like, you know, you can be great without letting the world know that you're great. You know, if you're great, people will talk for you. And, um, and then to see Shane Battier, who I'm on a committee with, USA Basketball, he has those same values too. You know, just a gracious person, good dude, down to earth, good teammate. And but yet they were, you know, great at Duke, Indiana, Purdue. And then all three of them obviously had really good NBA careers. And it was always about, you know, the team. So those models right there are, are, are just some things that you, you try to take with you as a player. Um, I think Brandon saying those nice things because he wants more camp money. That, that's, that's the only thing I think with Brandon. <laughs> now, uh, we've, had, we've had a good time. Brandon's done a good job on our staff and has really worked hard. Um, and it's been hard, you know, because, you know, those guys that go and play 10 to 12 years overseas like he did, you know, it, it's hard to segue into the coaching world. And, and Brandon, you know, he did it through high school and AAU. And then obviously when you have an opportunity, just this familiarity with Purdue and his passion for Purdue with, you know, and then obviously I knew him from playing um, together um, in our playing days. But like, no, he's been great for our, you know, for our guys and great for our program. 
and uh, has really helped us win championships and have a lot of success. Yeah, you got to ask Brandon. Uh, he's got a couple funny stories of me and him. We played together in Venezuela uh, in 2000, I believe. It was a while back. He was a heck of a player. But um, so getting into your coaching, you started coaching at Washington Jefferson College, went on to Barton College, then three years at Eastern where uh, that's where I met you. Um, and then you went to Southern Illinois with Coach Weber, and you guys were really, really good. I mean, national spotlight. I remember no one wanted to play you guys. Uh, you end up becoming the head coach there, got NBC Coach of the Year. And so what I wanted to ask you about that was you built, you built a championship high-level national cha- – I mean, like a national power type of team at Southern Illinois, and you've done it at Purdue as well. Is how you build a team – and your philosophy for who you recruit and how you're building a team, was it different at the mid-major level at Southern than how you build a team at Purdue? Not really. Not really. I, I think it's, there's, there's, there's probably some differences, but there's way more similarities in terms of, you know, just building that culture. And to me, you know, culture is really just, you know, getting that trust with your players and being honest. You know, if, you, if you're direct and you're straightforward with guys and say, hey, you know, here's how we're going to handle things, you know, from a academic standpoint, a social standpoint, a basketball standpoint, and you lay things out there. But it's good to get to your guys and say, hey, you know, if you guys have an issue with any of these things, how we kind of our pillars of our program. But if you do, let's talk about it. Let's don't get it somewhere and then all of a sudden somebody's mad about how things are. Like, you know, speak up. You know, let's improve our product. Let's get better each year. Um, but also – try getting some ownership um, within your players. You know, you can't have guys that will just have strong personalities and then have weak values and you think that's going to work. You know, you got to try to get guys to understand that, you know, hey, we want to – we're going to have to sacrifice here. Every single person in, in team sport is going to have to sacrifice and do some things. And everybody wants to play shortstop and lead off. You know, who doesn't? You know, not everybody can do that. And – uh the, the roles that you get into, they think it's shaped by me. They think it's shaped by the staff. And your roles and what you do is shaped on your production. And a lot of times, you know, like Marcus, what you work on isn't what we're going to do. What you work on and what you're productive in is what we're going to do. And so guys will be like, hey, man, I've been working on my game or whatever. And you're like, well, your, your step back still stinks. You know, you, you make 23% when you're on your step backs. Right. Going left, going right, I don't care when you take your step back. It doesn't go in, right. and you have to be direct with people. And I don't think you have to crush guys, um, but you also got to be able to be diplomatic and straight up with them. But that's really like setting the tone with it is you, know, you have to have an eye on, on somebody's functionality as a player. And, you know, you can't just uh, amass a bunch of talent and get it figured out. So, oh, you'll, you'll figure it out. That's, that's not the way it is. If you can kind of see that certain guys aren't going to be able to play outside of their role as the best player. And it's going to be hard for that guy unless he actually is going to be your best player. Like sometimes things work, sometimes they don't work. In basketball, it's kind of hard, especially at at a high level. Um, You you don't have a chance to reshuffle your deck when you make mistakes too often. You you get into about two bad years and you're you're probably looking um, to hit the highway. It's, It's just the natural reality of it. So you've got to have some consistency and that consistency lies with, with the makeup of the people that you bring into your program, the assistance that you have. But you got to have players. Um, you know, you got to have the, the talent. It's funny when you have a set of plays and how you do things, and then all of a sudden a person leaves or a group of people leave, and you're like, oh, man, these plays aren't quite as good. You know, and so that, that's your product, man. Just I think building a program lies with having great people um, as support staff and as assistants and a great administration, but the, the, the players that you bring into the program. And if you can find the ones that make everybody better, you know, those are special. Those are special people. Um, you know, you're a guy that scored 2,000 points in college. You have a special trait. You bring something with you to where we can work around this. Carson Edwards has a special trait. We can work around this. You know, his weaknesses and your weaknesses don't get magnified because you can put the ball in the basket because we all have weaknesses. We want to try to diminish those as much as possible and magnify those strengths. And that's what's beautiful. Like our team that almost went to the Final Four, you know, those guys that were around him were perfect for him. You know, they made him better. You know, he necessarily wasn't a guy that's always going to make other people better because he was just a scorer. 
he was just a flat out score. And so that was cool. Like we rolled with that, but our guys embraced that. Their, their humility and their understanding this was best for Purdue really made it work because we played off of him so much. And that really worked for Klein and that really worked um, for Matt Harms and for Grady and from No Gel Eastern. It just, um, we just had a good group, you know, that, that, that went around him. But that can't work without him. You know, I always say about a Big Ten championship, go back there. You know, we don't win a Big Ten championship without Caleb Swanigan. You know, the next year, Vince Edwards, Dakota Mathias, Isaac Haas, B.J. Thompson, that group of seniors, they were so successful. But, you know, you have to have that kind of substance. And um, sometimes that substance can lie in your decision-making and your skill. And that's where we took a little bit of a, uh, a drop this year is that our, our decision-making wasn't quite as good. Our skill wasn't quite as good. Uh, but our league was great, too. So, like, you know, you had to have your pencil sharpened, man, every single night and being ready to roll. So I know I rambled there and, uh, you know, and talked a lot about, you know, being at Southern Illinois and, and being at Purdue. Southern Illinois was special to me um, just because it was Coach Weber finally getting a chance. He was an assistant for 17, 18 years at Purdue and just trying to help him and get that thing rolling. Uh, but the people at Southern Illinois were great. They're, they're very uh, basketball-educated people. Uh, they had great tradition there, you know, through the years. And so – to be able to get that going, we had a couple guys that were there when we first got there, Monte Jenkins, um, Chris Tennell, Derek Tillman. Um, we took a kid named uh, Ricky Collum in our first year, and those guys had a lot of substance. So it was good to get started. Kent Williams was probably our biggest grab um, to start with. He ended up scoring 2,000 points. And then we added guys, Jamal Tatum, Darren Brooks, two-time MVP, Stetson Harris, then Brad Korn, Sylvester Willis, Brian Turner. We just had a good group of dudes, man. And it was just fun to coach them. It was fun to be around. But they were about winning. You know, a lot of times guys look at it like so narrow-minded. Um, but they, they were about winning. All those dudes I mentioned, even, you know, if you take 2,000-point scores or some guy that averaged five, you know, they all sacrificed to some degree to help Southern Illinois, you know, get back on the map. And that's what's getting a good job. Like Southern Illinois had a couple lean years, but Rich Heron had done a great job there. They had a lot of – a lot of really good players, a lot of pros through the years. Um, so we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel at Southern Illinois. We were just trying to get back on track, and that's what was cool about the opportunity to, to be there as an assistant coach and then for a head coach for one year. But then going to Purdue, you know, let, let's get this going again. You know, we've had a lot of success at Purdue before I was the coach. Let's just try to get it back to where Coach Katie had it, and, uh, you know, that, that, that's just part of it. But taking a job that's already had success and following someone who was, you know, was a Hall of Fame coach, you know, that really helps. There's no doubt because you got that blueprint. And so a lot of what we did at Southern Illinois with Coach Weber and with what, you know, I've done at Purdue, that's been Coach Katie's blueprint. And anytime you can have great mentors like those two guys, uh, makes it a lot easier. Yeah, yeah, you were following a legend. And speaking of that, coming, you came over in 05, 06 as the associate head coach, but it was pretty much planned that you were going to take over when uh, Coach Katie retired. So what was that What was that transition year like coming in, and you know that this is basically your team next year, but Coach Katie is still the head coach. How did you navigate that, just knowing that this was your team? Uh, yeah, well, it was you know. difficult, Marcus, to be honest with you, because, you know, he was a legend, Hall of Fame coach. And we weren't very good. And, uh, you know, he deserved to go out better, in my opinion. You know, he deserved to win all of his games. You know, I think those great ones, um, they put in so much. You know, he's coached close to 50 years. So you just want to see him be successful. We just didn't have the manpower um, to do it. So I recruited a lot that first year, to be frank with you, and, and tried to get the lay of the land because who I was recruiting at Southern Illinois is not who I was recruiting at Purdue. You know, I, you know, you, you, you're going to recruit different guys or some guys that are kind of on that fringe. And that's one of the statements I made, you know, at Purdue when I first got there and said, like, the great players in the Missouri Valley would be great in the Big Ten, too. They just would. And that's my opinion. You would have been a great Big Ten player. Kent Williams would have been a great Big Ten player. Maybe not hit it quite the same as a freshman, depending on the situation. But as time would grow, you'd become a 20 – 21, 22-year-old guy, you'd have been great. And I always say that, you know, when you're good, you're good. When you're great, you're great. And there's a lot of things that, that go with that. And then my first year as a head coach, our two best players um, had torn their ACL. One had done at the start of practice. The other one had done it the previous year and then was slow to rehab. He started to play that year, but he just – he wasn't full strength. And so he, 
use that as his redshirt year and David Teague and Carl Landry. So we, we won um, seven games the year I was an assistant and then nine games my first year as a head coach. Those 16 wins was the worst two-year period in the history of Purdue basketball. And so that was my start <laughs> at Purdue. And then those two guys got eligible, not eligible, they got healthy. And then we signed Chris Kramer and we signed Keaton Grant. And that was really the start right there. And that's a lot what happens with coaches. Like, if you don't have somebody waiting there that can help you get your start, sometimes it's hard to get going. It just is. But David Teague and Carl Landry got it going. We were able to sign Chris Kramer and Keaton Grant. Um, and, and those guys really uh, helped us. We got fourth my, first, my second year in the Big Ten. Um, won a game in the NCAA tournament, beat Arizona. Got beat by the eventual national champ, Florida, by I think seven or eight points um, in, in, in the second round. But, but that, was, uh, that was tough. And, and I, there was a part of me that really wanted to stay at Southern Illinois. So it's really hard. You have that range of emotions. And then the players that, you know, produced for us at Southern, if they didn't do those things, and, you know, I wouldn't have got that opportunity. So you just have such a, a tough range of emotions. But I'm very, very thankful for the players and the coaches and Bruce Weber and everybody at, at Southern Illinois. I wouldn't have got this opportunity you know, to coach at my alma mater and uh, coach at Purdue. Yeah, you guys had a role in that Southern, definitely. And I think you're completely right about the high-level players at a mid-major. Uh, they can definitely play in the Power Five conferences. And you kind of touched on this, and I was going to ask you, but it sounds like a lot of the, the reason the first year when you I think you guys went 9-19 and 19 your first year, um, and then you had a 13-game turnaround yes. the following year. And that's when you made it to the tournament, lost to – one of the great championship teams, those Florida teams that were good with, uh, you know, Al Horford and Joaquin Noah and stuff. But how did, you know, for, for the coaches out there that had bad seasons and they want to get better the next season, what, was there something that you did that summer to have such a dramatic 13-game swing? Or was it really just a matter of you finally got some players healthy? We got some players healthy. You know, we didn't really try to change a whole lot. We've always tried to adjust some things on the offensive end and just learn from our mistakes and, really grow with the game, you know, learn from other coaches and other situations. Um, but for us, Carl Landry was a high-level player. David Teague was a high-level player. So the next year, Carl was first-team All-Big Ten. David was second-team All-Big Ten. They averaged the same amount of points. Uh, they scored the same amount of points identical um, in Big Ten play. They both averaged 17. And so and then Chris Kramer was an elite defender. And then Keaton Grant ended up being just a great player for us, you know, kind of a combo guard. Um, that had good size. So it was really getting those guys and then just kind of shaping the team around that core. And then, you know, we were able to sign um, each one more, Robbie Hummel, Juwan Johnson in that 2007 class. So then when Carl and David left that next year, those three guys came in and uh, we actually had another guy named Scott Martin who played one year then transferred to Notre Dame. They came in and, and to go along with uh, KG and uh, Chris Kramer. And that was, that was our nucleus that we, that we grew with. And uh, we obviously had four great years. Those next four years, um, we got first and we got second three times. And so obviously Robbie Hummel had some injuries in there that affected that um, for one of those years. We had, we had a bad break our, our first year. We were 15-3 and three in our league. Wisconsin won at 16-2. and two, And their only two losses was to us. And uh, Brian Butch actually banks in a three at Indiana. Um, if you wouldn't have banked in that three, uh, we, we would have tied for the Big Ten Championship. But there's always stories like that when you get second place about the, this could have went this way or that way. And so, uh, but we've been fortunate to have some really good players. Those three uh, players that I mentioned there, Rob, each one, and Juwan, have been unbelievable for us, but unbelievable for me, and, you know, in my career. Like my career, I'm not, I, we don't get those guys. There's no way we have that kind of success. And I'm probably not sitting here doing this podcast with you. So I'm very, very, thankful for them and all they did for me and our, you know, and all they've done for Purdue. Yeah. They, you had a role in there, like you said, after Landry, then you brought in that class and it's been all uphill ever since. So after that, you know, I wanted to, you, you had that initial success. Then the next year, you're big 10 coach of the year. Uh, you go to the sweet 16 and then you were, I think you got your first opportunity to coach with USA basketball. So always any coach that has that opportunity to coach for his country, how, how was that getting that call and being having that opportunity to coach and represent your country? And then, you know, if you could, who were some of the players that you yeah. were a part of uh, during that time? 
Yeah, well, in 2009, I was originally just uh, with USA Basketball. Coach Weber and Coach Katie helped me get involved. And I was just going to be a, a court coach, um, you know, for the 2009 U19 World Championships. No, it was just the U19 to win the World Championships. And, um, but I was just going to be a court coach just for the trials going there. Bob McKillop had just lost um, Steph Curry at Davidson. So he was going to be the head coach. And then he had to back out. And he had, uh, you know, he had everything playing at Davidson of Steph Curry State. But when Steph Curry leaves, your plans change a little bit. So he stepped down. Jamie Dixon was going to be the assistant. And then he became the head coach. Chris Lowry was going to be his assistant. So then I, I was fortunate. I was kind of the last man on the staff that I was able to kind of morph in there as an assistant. And we were able to win a gold medal. Clay Thompson actually came off the bench for us. So it kind of shows you how good we were. Uh, but he. Clay was good, man. Clay, Clay obviously can shoot the basketball, and um, obviously he's just kept getting better, and obviously he's grown into one of the best players in the world. So, But uh, we had a good team. I've coached a couple different uh, teams. We had a guy named Darius Miller from Kentucky who's played in the NBA. He was a good player, um, you know, for that group. Tyshawn Taylor from Kansas. Uh, Ashton Gibbs from Pittsburgh um, was on that team. So Tariko White from Ole Miss. Um, I'm always scared I'm going to leave some guys out. John Scherner from Northwestern, um, the big kid that was at from Memphis that went to Mississippi State. You had a lot of guys. Howard Tompkins, who played a little bit in the NBA yeah. from Georgia, um, uh, was with that group. So we had a really good team and had a close game in the gold medal game and were able to pull it out. So, But, no, it's uh, I've had um, a lot of experiences, you know, with USA basketball. I ended up coaching a team in Shenzhen, China, for the world championships teams. Then we ended up – taken Purdue's team as a representative of USA. Um, in 2017, we won a silver medal there. Um, that was in Taipei, Taiwan. And so, you know, I had that experience. Then I've been on for about eight years now. I've been on the USA Basketball Selection Committee. So now I'm the last three years going into my fourth year. Uh, I'm the chair of that selection committee. So just, just had, you know, great, you know, opportunities and great experience and uh, just – Anytime you get to represent your country in any capacity, it's pretty cool. You've named some uh, some really good players that you've had a chance to coach and be around. And takes me to my next question. You guys have been at the top of the Big Ten. You're either winning it or you're in the top three every year. And so for the next question I'm going to ask you, I think most coaches can relate to, you know, your recruiting classes is not usually four one-and-done type of kids. You know, right. you, you, you got high-level players. Caleb Swinning is good. You know, Etuan Moore, you bring in good players. But, you know, at the high school level, you do have the prolific preps and the Mount Birds. And, you know, at the college level, there's the Kentuckys and the Dukes that have, the, have that. But for, for your guys that consistently win, and you don't always, on paper at least, bring in the, the most talent, what do you look for for all of us coaches that want to figure out we don't have all the resources that these other schools have? Right. What are you looking for in a player? And then what are you looking for as you're trying to build a team that has allowed yeah. you to build a team the way you do? Yeah, well, most of the time what gets ranked is your athleticism. And um, we all know the functionality of the game isn't always about your athletic ability. You know, does that help you? Well, sure, it helps you. There's no question it helps you. The more athletic you are, the better chance you have to make certain plays and to be productive on both ends of the court. But, you know, just the skill level, you know, trying to find guys, I think some things get lost in the evaluation process. I think people get too worried about recruit too much too worried about recruiting and don't understand how to evaluate. Like we all want our guys to make their free throws, right? And but why don't you recruit guys that shoot their free throws well just to begin with? Like why don't you say, you know, one of my requirements, man, we gotta get guards that, that can make their free throws, you know, because we'll take a great player that struggles at the free throw. Everybody will do that. But like what do they bring to the table? So really diving in and evaluate what they do. Like Ryan Klein in high school was a really, really efficient player. He had a great assist turnover ratio. He made his free throws. Um, he, he hit tough threes on the move at a high percentage. So a lot of times you'll grab um, somebody's three-point percentage. You'll say, hey, he's a good three-point shooter. Okay, now, now how's he getting those shots? Does he play with a good point guard? Does he play with a good big and get some inside-out ones? Does he get those rhythm ones in transition? How's he get? You know, Ryan Klein, like, they had long possessions in high school. He averaged 18 points. That's like averaging 28 points somewhere else. And he just had no high major offers. And, like, I had a lot of people, like, 
say something to me about him. And after seeing his numbers and watching him, I'm like, well, this guy's going to be great. Now he struggles to defend in space when he's 16, 17, 18 years old. And so like, what are you, what do you want to live with? Like, you know what I mean? What do you want to live with? Like as a coach, like, what do you want to live with? I'll live with either one of them if they're a great guy and they love the game and they're competitive and they're there to get a degree and they understand the big picture. I'll live with any of them. I really would. But I prefer to live with somebody who's going to stretch the defense, make threes, got a high basketball IQ, make their free throws, understand things. And he came from a winning culture. So uh, he's really a mid-major player, like we talked about, that translates to being real successful at the high major level. but you're going to bypass him because of those other things. And um, I, I like taking guys like that. Like Sasha Stavanovich is a guy like that. P.J. Thompson um, is a guy like that. You know, they, 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 Dakota Mathias is probably the top of that heap right there just because he's got a little bit more than those guys in terms of the way he can move. And he's such a great passer. He's a fabulous passer. And so trying to get as many guys as you can that fit that mold. Um, and, and I think that really helps them. When we've had guys that can shoot and when we've had guys that can think the game, we've been good. We've been good. Some years a little bit more than others, but we've been good. Now when you throw in an Isaac Haas or a Vince Edwards or a Caleb Swanigan into that fray with a whole bunch of people that can shoot and understand the game, now it's fun. Now you can't help off of anybody. You've got good spacing. You utilize what everybody can do because, you know, nobody can cheat off of anybody. So for us, we're just trying to go out and evaluate and see what works for us, but also trying to get those guys with that, that, that competitiveness, that basketball IQ, and that skill. Now, we've taken – we'll get off that a little bit when we deal with somebody who we feel has a high-level um, attribute in another area, like a big guy, like Isaac Haas at 7'2". Like he's not going to have the same skill level as some of those guys, but he serves his purpose because he's great at what he does. No Jelly Eastern is a 6'7", 230, kind of a one through four we've played there. But he's an elite defender. So he doesn't have the same skill package when it comes to shooting as those guys. But then he's elite in another area. Um, he's a competitive guy. He came from a winning program. So we feel like we can piece that in and the other people's skill level can offset that. Now, sometimes your puzzle doesn't work perfectly like you want it every year. And, and that's – and that's difficult, but uh, that, that's part of it. That's part of competition, and then that's part of continuing to recruit. And the one thing about recruiting and having a job and being somewhere for a long time, your puzzle's never complete. Like you're always trying to maneuver a little bit, improve a little bit here and there, you know, just make some adjustments and do some different things to improve your product. So at the end of the day, that overall final puzzle and picture gives you the best chance to win at the end of the year. But you're always learning, man. There's, there's never a year where you don't make mistakes. There never should be a year um, when you don't learn something about yourself and your team. Yeah, man, you, you just if – if there's coaches out there watching, they, they really need to absorb everything you just said. You know, like this – it sounds like you trust your eyes on what you see, not always what the scouting report says. And, you know, right. you're not just always just trying to fill your roster up with five-star athletic guys. You're, you're literally building a team. You're finding what comp- – what – this skill set from this player, how it complements the other players you already have, building that puzzle, and how it fits the culture of your program and everything. So, no, that right. all that is all yeah, that you is awesome. You gotta have something where you fall in love with them as a player or a person, like you know, like from a basketball sense. Like you know, you're like, hey man, his winning ways. Like, like to me, I like going recruit. I like going out and see things, and I'm like, hey man, his winning ways are going to be good. We have to have that, and that's something to me where I'll get you know, that about a player and get excited about them as a person at times because they just like, hey, man, he's got some shortcomings, but, man, he's about winning. We have to have him. Or they got a skill set, you know, like Klein's skill set. I was just like, I was enamored with it. I was like, you know, he didn't start for us for three years. He probably said, well, you're enamored by it so much. You know, why in the hell didn't you start? Me? But Carson Edwards was pretty good. Dakota was pretty good. And uh, – but I, I just felt that. We got, we got a couple guys sitting out and Brandon Newman, uh, Mason Gillis, that I think their competitiveness and their ability to make threes are really going to help us. We have a couple guards, Jaden Ivey and Ethan Morton. Jaden's got such a high level of athleticism. He's got a good work ethic, um, been around the game. Ethan Morton's the best passer um, I've ever recruited. Just to win it, number one in his class, 
you know, both those guys just winners. Uh, Jay made the adjustment already, which I think helps guys when they get to college um, of working into a role. I got so hard. Like if you could hop on the scene, like, you know, Mahmoud abdul Rauf and average 30 points, well, God bless you. You know, I'm so happy for you. But that comes around about once every 10 years. You know, guys are going to have to morph into a role when they get to major college basketball. The two, our two last All-Americans are Caleb Swanigan and Carson Edwards, and they both averaged 10 um, as a freshman, and their efficiency numbers weren't very good. Um, it was hard for them. You know, it was hard for them. And then their sophomore year, you know, they both were All-Americans, and their efficiency numbers were off the charts. They had to go through that process. You know, they had to go through that tough first year, uh, which we all do. We, we all have tough first years. No one has easy first years, even if you have success. There's nothing easy about that transition. That's why morphing from that freshman, that sophomore year, man, is normally a big, big jump for guys because they start to – the game starts to slow down a little bit. So we're looking for some of that with our guys. We had some freshmen play this year. We had some guys go from freshman to sophomore year, really do some good things for us. And then we had some guys kind of take a step back a little bit. And that, that happens sometimes in competition – but then that's also the challenge when you expect a little bit more and then you don't have that. and You just don't have the year that you thought you did. Well, that's your challenge then, man. You know, now who's going to stay put and fight and get better and improve that they're a better player and that they can help us, you know, win games and win championships. Those, everybody has their different challenge in there, and that's what we try to do. We try to be really honest and upfront with our guys. Like, hey, this is what's happened. Here's where we are. Here's what's coming. Um, but let's, let's embrace a challenge and not give in to adversity. You know, too many dudes run, and too many dudes run away from adversity. adversity. Adversity is what shapes you. That's what makes you great, man. And then, like, sometimes guys don't quite get there with their career, um, but, like, staying and fighting and, you know, and getting after it and being a good teammate and trying to do what's best for Purdue, I always tell those guys, you do those things and you stay, I mean, Purdue's got you the rest of your life. You know, and, and, and people here at Purdue are very loyal, hardworking people, and, they'll, and they, they really love, you know, our team and our guys, and they'll do anything in the world for you. Yeah, a couple things from all that. I, I'm going to go back to what you said about the step from freshman to sophomore year. I remember as a player, I think I led my team in scoring as a freshman. And even though my point production went up as a sophomore, I felt I took a step back. My, my field goal percentage went down. Like you said, the expectations were higher. You're no longer catching people off guard. They have a full year worth of scouting to evaluate you. And so if you don't work hard that summer at the level that other teams are working hard to stop you, you're going to have a step back. So a lot of that has to, has to do with, you know, did you get a little bit of big head as a, young, you know, as a kid and think, oh, I'm good. I can do this. And then other people yeah. are still getting better. And then you didn't get improve as much as you should have over, right. over the summer. Yeah, I'm glad you said that because it's something that I harp on a lot with. and. I know this, and I wasn't there in between your freshman and sophomore year, but I know you put in time and you worked on your game. And I always talk to our guys about this. Like, you got to be able to work the physical as much as you work the mental. And what I mean by the mental is sometimes you go and work on your game and you play pickup, and then you go and shoot and you work on that. But you're not getting any better at making decisions. You know, your jumper's getting better. Your range is getting better. But is your decision-making getting better? Are you putting yourself into decision-making places where if they're going to run at me, I got to get the ball out of my hand, you know, on the break, you know, what am I, am I taking good shots? Cause your good shots going to be different than other people's good shots. So you got to be aggressive. You got to get to the free throw line. You got to do those things because that's your skill. So that's what I really tell guys. Cause I really embrace guys having an individual guy or having a trainer or having that. And then, but I always talk to them about is like, Hey man, I'm working on my game. I'm getting shots up. Just don't get shots up. Make, learn to make decisions. Learn to be able to move and shoot the basketball. Learn to be able to play off your shot uh, fake coming off of particular actions that we use. We do some different actions, dribble handoff after down screens, regular ball screen stuff. Make decisions. Have people out there jumping screens, hedging high, flat hedging, doing different things. So you're training your mind to think the right way and play the right way and really just do what the defense gives you. And each guy is going to be different. So when I think what happens a lot is that decision-making, that goes dormant for about five. That's in hibernation. Your decision-making is in hibernation. Your physical ability to get better is improving. Your range is improving. 
your jumper's improving. I'm getting shots up. I'm doing my ball handling. I'm doing my individual training stuff. But am I getting better as a – because your decision-making is what improves your percentages. You know, your ability to take good shots, to take shots in rhythm, um, to play off your shot fake, to, to, to raise your assist and lower your turnovers. You know, what's your assist turnover ratio? Because, you know, if you want to make it and you're a 6'3 guard and you want to go to the NBA, boy, you're a dime a dozen. You are a dime a dozen. But you don't think that way in your mind when you're a player and you're confident. You know, like Carson Edwards is a great example. How many 5'11 combo guards are there out there? There's not very many. But, like, you know, he's a special dude, man. Like, you know, he's a hardworking guy. He works on his game. He puts in time. He's relentless. He is relentless. Now, he's got good physical ability. He's probably got the biggest hands for anybody I've ever seen at 5'11". He's strong. Um, he's explosive. But he's got, a, he's got a strong will, too. And he's competitive, and the game means something to him. And, and so, but he's not a true point. His decision-making, you know, is not at that level. When he's there, he's a scorer. And so I think he's with the best coach that he could be with, Brad Stevens. He's one of the best coaches in the game. And uh, I'm happy for him because now he's got an opportunity to really grow and have a long NBA career. Uh, but a lot of times guys don't – they don't understand that piece, Marcus, about the decision-making. If anybody's, like, listening and you're young or you're in college or you're doing whatever, don't let that be dormant for four or five, six months because now you're just going to get back to the fall with your coaches – and they're going to start harping on the same things, playing the same way. And you're like, damn, I'm tired. You know what? I've worked on my game. Let me do what I want to do. Let me be me. Let me. And so you get into all that crap that gets said in between your ears. And that's noise, man. That's noise. You know, coaches are going to let cars. People say, well, you let Carson do this. I didn't let Carson do anything. He had a special gift. And I thought it made a whole lot of sense to let him roll. You know, I thought it made a whole lot of sense to let each one more roll. You know, they, they have a special gift, but they showed that they could be productive like that. Yep. And they did that. I didn't do that. That gets lost in a young player's mind. And yep. so you got to keep being honest with guys. But I don't, want, I don't want guys to lose that confidence about themselves. Sometimes when guys are upset with me, I love it. I love it, man. I'm like, hey, man, like you believe in yourself. Keep believing in yourself. But here's why. I think coaches get away or they think they don't have to explain why. Well, if you think that you don't have to explain why in, in 2020, then I don't think you're going to stay at your job very long. I just don't, right. unless you just got the best cats. I just don't think you are. I think you got to relate to guys. you got to be honest with guys. But also let some roles evolve. Let a guy who struggled as a freshman, I mean, give him, give him some rope in that summer and that fall and let him showcase, let him do some things. Now, once that practice starts and you start getting and he's and you can see that he hasn't progressed in those areas, you're going to have to tell him, like, hey, man, we're not shooting, you know, 18-footers off the dribble with 26 seconds on the clock when you make 22% of them. Sorry. We're, this isn't an experiment. You know, Purdue, we, we got to win some games here. we got to be smart about what we do. And so we did it this year after about three or four practices, and we showed all of our guys that their intermediate shots, their floaters, their runners, anything, especially with, you know, the clock in the 20s, did not make sense for us to do, anybody. Like, I've probably had two guys that right now that a strong analytic basketball mind um, out of the NBA, and that's his title, or out of college at a prominent program, would tell you, like, hey, it doesn't make sense to do that. I've probably had two guys where it's made sense to, to consistently shoot a runner or a floater that their percentage is from two, you know, and that's Tyrone Johnson and each one more. Those are the only two guys that probably have that consistent floater um, to where they do that now. Should you have that in, in your game for your pull-up game? Your sure. But should that be a low clock play? Yeah, that should be a low clock play. But you also can't ignore numbers. There's got to be a balance between the numbers, the analytics, and then having a feel through your own experiences, but also knowing your team. And that's why I like going out and recruiting myself a lot during the year. Because I, like the, I like when they're head honcho, man. I like when you're the best player in your high school team, everybody's gunning for you, but everything's being run for you. And how do you do in your element? How do you play in your element? And how do people, like, look at you and perceive you? Because um, that's who you are. You know, that, that's ultimately who you are. And then you can really get a good feel if they fit in your program or how productive you think they're going to be at your level. Man, I could talk ball with you all day. I'm going to let you go here. But I do want to touch on something you said about make, improving your decision-making in the offseason. Some people may not know how to do that. In my opinion, uh, 
if you have a trainer, if your trainer isn't watching film of you, he's not setting you up for success because any trainer can t take out some cones and have you work on, you know, a couple between the legs. And I, but if, if your offense is running the swing offense or running the flex or doing pin downs, your trainer needs to be running pin downs, having you come off and getting the ball in the spots that the coach expects you to get the ball in. And then right. from there, you need to be coming off, shooting that shot, or then making a wise decision. Do I shot fake? Do I go to the paint? That's where you improve your decision making because you become more comfortable in the spots that the coach wants you to get the ball. Very few times, unless it's the end of the shot clock, is the coach is going to say, hey, buddy, take that and just start taking five, six, seven, eight dribbles in and finish with that step back that you've been working on with your trainer all summer. It just doesn't work that way. And so put yourself yeah. in the positions of how it's going to be applicable yeah. to your coach and to your team. Uh, that, yeah. that, that's number one thing. And it's just tying it together. Yeah. I, I that to me is like when somebody has people that they work with a lot that are good, that that's all they try to do. They try to tie it together. So whether you've got ball screen motion or the pin downs in motion, we also got to help each guy within a team structure. And that gets lost in, in a lot of workouts. Like we got to do this within a team structure because that's what we're going to go back to. We don't want to lose that. But that what you said, Marcus, right there, that's just the functionality of the game right there. Putting guys into actions that they're going to get into their team and so now they get better from a skill standpoint but they also get better into the decision making that we were talking about yeah exactly right so i'm gonna close up here i got a couple more couple more things i would be remiss if there's purdue fans right now they probably want to want me to ask this what are some of your expectations and thoughts for next right. year's team a great story you know coach katie uh, lost his best player at purdue in 1983 a guy by the name of russell cross and um he was six pick six or seventh pick in the draft that year, they got picked ninth in the Big Ten. And then in 1984, they won the Big Ten. And uh, the, the interim president at the time was a guy named John Hicks um, for Purdue University. or He might have been the president. Um, but he had an autographed baseball of Babe Ruth. And he felt so confident that they weren't going to win the Big Ten after being picked ninth that he told Coach Katie, I know you're a Yankees fan. If we win the league, you get my autographed baseball of Babe Ruth. So in 1984 – he said that, and they won the Big Ten. So he still got that baseball. So, but what it really taught me was nothing changes at Purdue. I don't care where they, they, they pick us. They can pick us 14th. They can pick us first. It doesn't matter. You know, our goal is to win the Big Ten. And, uh, you know, we've been fortunate enough to win three of them since I've been there. Um, we've gotten second at least four times, maybe five times. We've been right there. We've had a couple thirds in there. Um, and people kind of look at it, you know, well, no big deal. Hey, man, it's hard. Our league is a tough, tough league. We have great coaches. We have great players. We have a great product. Um, but you got 14 teams now. You know, and so winning that league, man, especially going to 20 games, that's a grind. That is a real grind. And so that's our goal. You know, our goal is to do that. Not our only goal, but that comes before the NCAA tournament. You put yourself in that mix where you're first, second, third, you're trying to win that Big Ten championship. Hopefully you do. Now you're going to put yourself in a really good spot going into that NCAA tournament. And um, – now the NCAA tournament can kind of be a kind of be a crapshoot. You get on that neutral court, you could have a good seed, you could be out real quick. So you got to be able to make sure your guys understand getting there. But you got to get there first. And uh, we've had a lot of success at Purdue and been to a lot of tournaments. But each year is a new year, so that's really the Purdue fans that you know just you know we're excited about the season. You know I, I love our team, and uh, we're looking forward to really looking forward to the growth. Some new guys coming in. Um, ready to play, some guys who set out ready to play, um, some returners coming back, making that next step, and uh, having good junior years, sophomore years, senior years, and uh, really just embracing that and trying to get us back to the top of the Big Ten and uh, and have some fun. Yeah, as, as long as you've been there, you guys have been at the top of the Big Ten. And like you said, I don't think people realize. It depends on what area of the country. Um, some people say the ACC. Some people say the Big Ten. Just, yeah, you know where your, where your allegiance lies, but for you to be number one or two year in year out, you know it, you've got it to the point now to where your fans expect you to be in the top two or three. So, and that's a good thing. Um, yes. Great last thing. thing I'll say, last thing I'll ask coaches, I ask this everybody that comes on. It's called the details of life. So I, you know, obviously I bring on people that have had some levels of success in their life, and so from a high school player to mid major to USA basketball to now, you've been successful 
in a lot of different stops. So are there any uh, details or, or, or habits or daily routines that you do that, that you think or you have done that you think uh, put you in position to be successful? Um, I've just been consumed with the game. I think that takes away from some other things. Like um, I read a lot about basketball. I study a lot about basketball. Um, it's my passion. Um, no way around it. Um, would be a basketball coach. You know, people that become basketball coaches don't do it for money. They do it because they like people. They like basketball. You know, I like seeing people get better. One of the things I say all the time, and it kind of comes off corny, and I know our guys probably don't like it, but it's true. Like, well, let's make our hard work fun. Like, I want to make it fun for them. Because I wake up every day to have fun. I wake up every day to, you know, love people and embrace people and, you know, embrace the opportunity we're in. Because we're not going to be in this position. As a player, you know that in college. You're not going to be in this position forever. You're, you're just not. But I'm not going to be the head coach at Purdue forever. So I, I need to, you know, also – be grateful and understand that, but make the most of it. And uh, more than anything, just trying to not lose our soul in the process, but, you know, just try to get to the final four, win a national championship, doing it the right way, you know, for the Purdue fans, you know, for our former players that have battled that haven't been able to quite um, get there. And uh, because I, I think Purdue's a special place and uh, it's great, you know, having two dreams is what I always tell every guy I'm recruiting. Like, hey, man, like, I got two dreams, you got two dreams. One's through education and one's through basketball. And if you do that and, uh, you know, you keep your head on straight, good things are going to happen for you. Awesome stuff, man. Well, thank you for spending so much time here. I didn't know that we were going to talk this long, but, man, like I said, I could talk basketball with you all day. You're one of the yeah. good guys. You're one of the good guys in the industry. I can honestly say that, and I love what you're doing at Purdue. Really thank happy you. for all the success you're having there. So good luck this summer. Hopefully we're able to get out and get – Get back in the gym with these kids and recruit and everything. And good luck to you next season, Coach. Cool. Thanks for having me on, Marcus. Appreciate All right, take, it. All right. Take care. All right. See you. Thank you so much, Matt, for coming on the show and giving us all that game. And, you know, I really appreciate you. You know, for all you guys out there, you know, I, one thing I have to point out is this is one of the best coaches in the country. This just isn't somebody sitting around the couch with nothing to do. Right. He's out recruiting. He's still building up a powerhouse in the Big Ten to take that much time out. And to be that engaging and that involved in this conversation lets you know he's a good guy. So any of you fans out there that well, you don't really have an allegiance to a team or a coach or whatever, you want to root for the good guys. Matt Painter is one of the good guys. So thanks again, Matt, for coming on and best of luck to you. Coming up next, we have another good young coach, head coach of Illinois State University, Dan Muller. Dan used to be one of my arch nemesis back when I played. He was two-time defensive player of the year in the Missouri Valley Conference, played a little bit in Europe, came back started coaching, and is now a really good head coach, spent a, a lot of time as an assistant at Vanderbilt where they had that success when he was with uh, Coach Stallings when they were winning SEC tournaments and everything, and now he's at Illinois State. So we talk about a lot of good things I think you guys are going to learn from, and you know what? We still got some good people coming on because many of you know I'm from South Bend, and I'm a big Notre Dame football fan, and so to be able to have Coach Mike Bray, head coach of Notre Dame basketball on, was a, was a big deal for me. You know, we also got Brian Mullins. Uh, head coach of Southern Illinois, Brad Brunel from Clemson's coming on. We got some more people. I'm not going to name drop everybody, but I, trust me, there's some more heavy hitters coming. Those are just a few off the top of my head. So make sure you keep coming back. These guys are coming on. They're they're being open. They're they're telling you what they do to be successful. They're sharing the details because that's right. Greatness is in the details, guys. Continue to like, subscribe, share, spread the word, get it out there. Tell everybody to come watch and listen. Let's keep growing. See you guys next episode. Thank you for tuning in. Peace.